They came on dreams, the immigrants, to build a nation. Observe the laws of Canada. Observe the laws of Canada. And fulfill my duties as a Canadian citizen. It's July, 1993. We're in Austin, Quebec. The town is celebrating the arrival of its first settler 200 years ago by putting this memorial stone in a prominent place. Nicholas Austin was one of the first white settlers in the eastern townships of Quebec. He'd been a gentleman farmer in New Hampshire. He moved up here in 1793 10 years after the American Revolution. He was looking for a kingdom of tolerance and peace. He was a Quaker, 57 years old. He was my ancestor. The town of Austin is his legacy. Population 4,000. This is Lake Memphremagog. It's 45 kilometers long, and it lies at the heart of the eastern townships of Quebec. It was first settled by refugees from the American Revolution, like Nicholas Austin. Now the French are in the majority. But this is one of several of the townships where we Anglophones are still alive and well. This is the house where my mother was born. And this is the cottage where I have spent all 66 summers of my life. This is my son, Nicholas, beginning to be curious about the ancestor he was named after. And this is my sister, Eleanor, a great source of family history. This painter, Edward Hicks, he was um, adopted into a Quaker family when he was a boy, and he painted them. Um, lovely, peaceful images that give a good sense of a Quakerly view of life in the world. In colonial America, Quakers were mostly gentlemen farmers. But they were considered a threat to the Puritan establishment because they didn't believe in churches or paid preachers. They believed that each individual carried the inner light, and that included people of all colors and persuasions. He did many, many, many called the Peaceable Kingdom. There's one there. <laughs> They're all the same. Full of uh, wild animals lying down together and cherubs and things. In the background of this Peaceable Kingdom is all the animals. Is this treaty made with native Pennsylvanians there. That's William Penn, who was a Quaker for whom Pennsylvania is named. And Pennsylvania was a Quaker state. William Penn was an idol, not only of Hicks, but I think of Nicholas Austin, too, who had in mind the kind of society that William Penn managed to create in uh, Pennsylvania. The hopes of Nicholas Austin for building such a society in New Hampshire were shattered in 1775. Um, man Howard Pyle, he was born into a Quaker family, and um, boy, in his work it's uh, hard to look at, but it's very... Uh, Dramatic. Yeah, it's a, showing every good reason to be a pacifist. They're all horribly mutilated yeah. here. Quakers' belief in the inner light of every man turned them against war as a solution for social problems. For them, the American Revolution did nothing to stop the slaughter of Indians, or to liberate black slaves, or to guarantee the religious tolerance that Quakers had been seeking for over a hundred years. A few years after the revolution ended, Austin heard that the governor of Quebec was offering a hundred square miles of wilderness 
to anybody who could provide enough men and money to build the roads, bridges, and mills needed to establish a township. So for several years, he explored the western shores of Lake Nefermagog and learned from native Abenakis how to survive in the wilderness. He built a cabin to protect himself from wolves, bears, mountain lions, and the moose fly. It was near a jut of land he called Gibraltar Point. Not far from this point, Austin cleared a field and sowed the first crop of corn. It was the summer of 1793. He moved his wife and six children when winter came. Teams of oxen needed frozen surfaces over which they could pull their sledge loads of food and supplies. It took the Austins a month to cover the 200 miles. They often had to sleep at night in two feet of snow. They must have wondered what on earth Nicholas was getting them into. <laughs> Nicholas Austin needed the help of an exceptional person. I don't know much about his wife, Phoebe. Like most frontier women, she left few traces. But I do know it must have been a marriage of love because she was not a Quaker, and she left a comfortable life in New Hampshire to come here with Nicholas. Here, there was no school, no store, no doctor. Phoebe had to feed, clothe, and educate her six children by herself. She was 47 years old when they came. This is Malcolm Juby. He was born across the road from my cottage. His farming family has been here on Austin land for three generations. You ever try cutting down one of those big trees with an ax? No. No? No, I'm not that uh, enthusiastic. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> no. Imagine how enthusiastic he must have been at the age of 57 to go out and chop down. Yeah, it's hard to trees. imagine that he really had courage to get going. Yeah, it was hard work. They only used axes, and the old timers uh, that are still left, they, they, they call an opening where the wood was cut a chopping. All the area was wooded, so their biggest uh, job to start with was to get enough land opened up so that they could start to grow some crops, even grass and uh, cereal crops, so that they could keep some animals. Phoebe, like most Quaker wives, was an educated and genteel lady. She had not been trained to milk cows, but she learned fast. It's all pretty good soil. There's quite a lot of rocks around, but of course this right here, I've worked it up for four or five years now and put quite a bit of manure on it. And I had uh, some excellent potatoes this year, red potatoes and white potatoes. You think that's probably what Nicholas Austin grew when we came here? I would imagine that's one of the first crops that he did have was potatoes. They grew turnips and they grew uh, all the garden vegetables that we, were, we would have had uh, today. I think they would have had a full line of, uh, of crops. One of the first uh, sources of income that they had, of course, was pearl ash, which they cut the hardwood trees down and they burnt them and they collected the ash to be sold in Montreal or exported into the huh. United States market. Leached ash was used then for making soap and gunpowder. It was a mainstay on the frontier because it could be sold in city markets in exchange for what was lacking in the bush. Sugar, salt, tea, books and pencils.
My gosh, thanks a lot. Used to do that all the time. Yeah. Climbing the waterfall. Okay. okay. Favorite kid activity and then go up to that pond up there where that stuff is. Okay, yeah. And uh, catch the frogs. That's I quite a magnificent old mill though, huh? Yeah, it's fabulous. It's stupendous. You know, that was built in approximately the early uh, 1800s by uh, a man by the name of Thompson who was one of Austin's associates. He built it as a grist mill in order to grind the uh, wheat that the early settlers in this area used to make their bread. This mill is the only thing left around here from Austin's time. It's what he needed to populate his township. Government surveyors called the township Bolton. Oh, look at that. Uh -huh. Bolton Pass. So Nick, you know about Bartlett? who did uh, drawings, drawings of this part of the world in the middle of the 19th century. The British artist William Bartlett didn't visit Canada until 1838, but his etchings capture beautifully the spirit of Austin's time. Well, there's Copps Ferry that went across from Austin's side of the lake to uh, the Georgeville, Georgeville side of the lake. Yeah. Lake Memphremagog was called Mamrabagak in the Abenaki language. That means great expanse of water. It was expansive enough to support a population of several thousand by the time these etchings were made. Quebec City. Austin came here to sell ash, but also to seek exemption from military service for his Quaker sons. Looks like a nice, busy, flourishing market. Yeah. yeah. Probably what he envisioned for Austin. Yeah, could be, yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Seeing that can in there reminds me that, that on one of his trips to Quebec City, the governor's very pleased with him and with the idea of his Quaker community. So as a present, he gave him a cannon. Mm, how useless. <laughs> Not understanding that Quakers <laughs> were pacifists. You no doubt had in mind Nicholas putting it on Gibraltar Point and shooting south, shooting south. against invading intruders, in invaders from Vermont. Nicholas didn't take it; he left it in <laughs> Quebec City. Saint Benoît du Lac Monastery, only sixty years old, built by the Benedictine monks who were expelled from France in 1912. They came here, like Austin himself, looking for a place of tolerance and peace. Every year, thousands of pilgrims come here seeking rest and reflection. And while here, they learn something about the history of this corner of Quebec. Hello. <laughs> Father Bolduc is responsible for the monastery's relations with the outside world. Uh, the first settlers were very religious people. Uh, they were Quakers, Protestants, so not of the same religion as us. But they worshipped the same God. They were people who gathered on Sunday to read the Bible. We at the monastery carry on the same tradition, so we feel a certain sympathy with him. Uh, we have several books in our library that speak about uh, Nicholas Austin, especially the one about his encounter with the regal prince in Quebec. There was a banquet to which Austin was invited. The Quakers had the habit of wearing big hats. At the banquet, they asked him to take his hat off, because you're not supposed to eat at the banquet like that with your hat on. But he didn't do it. A social difference. He didn't want to show there were different social levels between people. Each time he went to Quebec, he had to negotiate with a lot of vigor. He had to work hard to become the owner of such a big piece of land. When you became the head of a township, you had to find people to inhabit and exploit the land. He had to make many trips between Quebec and Vermont. 
but Osden was stonewalled in Quebec by the governor's council. Members of the council and their merchant allies held things up while they lobbied for land for themselves in the eastern townships. His associates were supposed to reimburse him for clearing the land and building roads. But they didn't come because they had to wait three to five years for the land deeds. So it didn't work out as a community. Many of his colleagues took their share of the land and promised to come settle, then left and sold their share. There were land speculators even back then, 200 years ago. Austin's dream of a Quaker community in Quebec was not to be. Most of the 100 square miles of his township fell into the hands of squatters and land speculators, and the rest of it was seized to pay his debts. He ran out of time, but his pioneer spirit still permeates this land. This is the city of Magog at the head of the lake. It's a thriving town of 14,000 souls. It was once called Austin's Mill because Nicholas built the first grist mill here in 1795. Tourism replaced textiles as the major industry here when the auto route opened 30 years ago. Now, everybody wants a piece of the action. Developers see the lake, the beauty of this place, and they think condos, ski resorts, theme parks, Dunkin' Donuts. The people of Austin, 10 kilometers down the lake, want to make sure that that doesn't happen here. Some of them remember how land speculators almost broke Austin 200 years ago. They have called a public meeting to object to a developer's proposal to rezone one corner of their town. There's a potential for overdevelopment of the whole area. We're going to end up, it's going to end up looking like Beaconsfield. And that's not why we, that's not why we all moved down here. Half of the people here are year-round residents. The other half are weekend cottagers from places like Beaconsfield, a suburb of Montreal. But they all feel like custodians of the land they inherited from Nicholas Austin. We take the chance of, of ruining our best resource in this whole town is that lake. The lake is what everyone comes for. There is an overwhelming majority of people who expressed opinions against change. There will therefore be no change in the council's position. The people of Austin win this time with the help of the mayor. Roger Nicolet, a civil engineer, has been mayor for 20 years. His fluency in both English and French has helped maintain Austin as a haven of tolerance and peace. The people who succeed in keeping their attachment to their way of life demand respect. Ils ont, sur différents plans, un attachement à certaines valeurs, à certaines... They have an attachment to certain values, traditions, ideas that are remarkable in a world so full of change. I believe Malcolm Juby is the kind of person Mayor Nicolet is talking about. He clings to what matters most his intimate relationship with this land and its history. People like Malcolm and Mayor Nicolet and Father Bolduc have created a community here which I think is close to the peaceable kingdom that Austin had in mind. Nicholas Austin lived to the age of 85. He asked to be buried under a birch tree here at Gibraltar Point. He died in 1821. Nobody marked his grave. 
Qu'est-ce que ça te fait d'avoir à revenir ici What does it mean to you to be here on the territory of your own ancestors? Ben, justement, ça me donne beaucoup d'honneur. I think it's a great honor. I'm very happy to know that my ancestors founded such a beautiful place. I think it's quite an extraordinary exploit that a man of his age can master such a difficult area and was able to make it into the land that it is today. An incredible place, very peaceful, with lots of harmony between people. Nicholas is the youngest of my seven children. I like to think that Austin's spirit of tolerance and peace will live on in them. So Nick, do you uh, think that he would have been disappointed in the way his life turned out the last 30 years? No. You don't? No way. He had so much to live for in a place like this. There's no chance he could have he could have been disappointed in what he had. He might have been poor, but he lived such a full life. He had enough energy and exuberance for 10 generations to come. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and I think he knew that what he did was not for his generation. And so he knew that what he was going to do was for the next ones to come. Hmm. So they could reap the rewards of a fabulous place like this.